get into jail, we can't afford it, so we just got a policy to turn out. Sometimes you can do that, sometimes you can't. If there is a, if you see bodily injury, you shall arrest. That's what the state law says. You shall arrest. It doesn't say may, you shall arrest. Okay? Um, and then there, then you can call and get a uh, advocate on the phone with the victim and, and go that route. But you're, somebody's going to get arrested if you can figure out who the, uh, primary aggressor is. I don't know how, yeah, you got 72 hours to arrest somebody. So like if I go to your house and your wife's got some bruises or your husband, women can do it. And uh, you're not, you're, your aggressor isn't there. We've got 72 hours to find them and arrest them based off that. If not, we got to get us a, a, a warrant. Unfortunately, most of the time, the victims change their mind, bail them out before we get to do anything, or decide, well, I love him, I'm not filing charges now. Prosecuting DV, domestic violence, is one of the toughest things we do. It's what's called a predicate offense, which means the first offense is typically a misdemeanor. Follow-on offenses can be charged as a felony. But the first thing I need everybody to understand is that domestic violence is complicated and it's very complicated for the victims. You know, they may have just gotten beat up, but that's also their spouse or their boyfriend or their girlfriend. Uh, that is the household income or a big part of it. That's the kid's parent. It's complicated. We try and sort out the domestic violence between people that are, you know, very often you have good people that are having a bad day and went too far. And it's really a singular act of an assault and battery in situation and then we've got some people that are just we call them batterers and they use violence and intimidation as a way to get what they want from their partner on a regular basis we're really targeting batterers very often the cases that we get we can only prosecute them with the assistance of the victim we try whenever we can, and so does law enforcement, to get other evidence, other corroboration, statements against interest made by the perpetrator. But a lot of times, we're left with someone, one of them has to testify against the other, and again, it's complicated for them. You know, we know from working these domestic violence cases, that even in severely abusive uh, relationships, it's more common than not that the abused person has left and returned seven, eight, nine times before they finally break off the relationship. And there's some relationships where we've seen where it's happened a lot more than that. You can't look the other way. Uh, you gotta report it, please report it. And one of the things that's really helpful is whenever there's somebody who is not part of that couple who says, I saw them fighting out front, he was beating her down and she was screaming for help. You think I can win that case? I can win that case. <coughs> the 
people have to be involved and you have to pay attention. It's always going to be with us, but we can do better at how we handle it and how we prosper. something real clear. I want, to, I want to give you the timeline of the Ellis incident. Okay? Uh, uh, how many here heard that Mr. Ellis cried in pain for days? Anybody? Okay, that's a key total misinformation. Right. I want to give you the timeline of what happened when Mr. Ellis was in custody. Okay? That way everybody understands what's going on. I just spent a week and a half sitting in this trial, listening, watching video, and all that. Okay. So on 1017, Mr. Ellis was already in jail. It was a Saturday. And he complained about his back hurting. And he said that his back was broke and that from sleeping on the bunks. So it was Saturday, so the nurses called and uh, said to give him some pain reliever, liver, pain reliever, and to lie down, and that she would see him on Monday. So Monday rolls around, the nurse sees him. Um, he's just complaining of his back problem, and he's, he's, he's kind of pointing to one certain area on his back. And so she made a diagnosis, but she ain't supposed to have an opinion, but hey, she said that you got a got a rib out. Gave him some Tylenol, sent him back in there. That was on the 19th. Nothing was heard from Mr. Ellis until the 21st. On the 21st is when the ambulance was called. Uh, prior to that, Mr. Ellis is seen on video walking around the pod, going to the restroom, and all that stuff. So. He goes up to the door and one of the jailers says when he's at the door, he uh, is complaining because he can't see or call his grandpa and that if we're not going to let him call his grandpa that he's going to sue the county. The jailer says, I can't let you call your grandpa, there's a phone in the pot. So he walks over to his bunk, you can see this on video. He walks over to his bunk and a couple minutes later the inmates are yelling for staff because he's having a seizure. So staff goes in there, an ambulance is called, a medical shows up, uh, he's coherent, talking to him, they take his vitals, everything but the O2, uh, he's talking with him, they don't find nothing emergent with him, he's sitting there with his uh, blood pressure cuff on, and he goes, hey, can I use one of your guys' phone to call my grandpa? And they all said no. At that time, he gets upset, he throws his uh, blood pressure cuff off and said, to hell with you, take me to my cell. So everybody leaves. Mr. Ellis is seen then walking to H1. There's two holding cells down there, H1 and H2. H2 has a sink and a toilet in it. H1 has nothing in it, except what the famous D ring. They lay him in H1. Why? Nobody can tell us why. They just picked H1. It wasn't nothing special, they just picked H1. So they take him in there, and he lays down on the bunk, and I don't know exactly when, uh, what, what time this was, but they put him on a 15 minute medical watch. So this is later in the evening, so during the evening, late into the night, he starts complaining that his legs are hurting and that he can't move. Well, you see him on tape getting up and walking from the uh, holding cell to the bathroom with a cup of water, with a cup. So he does that three different times through the evening and into the night. So the nurses called and said, hey, he's complaining about his legs hurting. 
She says, keep an eye on him. Uh, note whether he's walking or not. I'll see him in the morning. Roger that. So he goes through one shift. He's walked twice. The midnight shift starts. That's passed on to him. And he is seen walking one more time during the midnight shift. And that was around 3 o'clock in the morning. The times are going to be approximate, all right? I don't have the exact times in front of me. So between that time and about 5.30 in the morning, you don't hear nothing from him at all. Um, about 5.30 in the morning, he starts talking to an inmate who's in one of the other holding cells, <clears throat> talking about a guy that got tased in the face on an arrest. He, he's saying nothing. He don't sound like he's uh, in any type of distress or anything like that. So he's talking with the inmate and during the night the nurse is called again. She said she'll see him in the morning. All right, so what he's saying about him not feeling his legs, not being able to walk is contradicting what they're seeing, okay? So if if you've got an inmate telling you, hey, I can't feel my legs, I can't walk, but he's getting up and he's walking to the bathroom, you kind of got to weigh whether, what's going on, right? But they called the nurse, okay? About eight in the morning is when stuff starts going downhill pretty quick. The day shift comes in, he starts really complaining bad about his legs, uh, about they're black, they're hurting, it's, it's bad. Um, two jailers walk over there and say, hey, nurse will see you when you get here, you're fine, blah, blah, blah. Okay. That's when he really starts yelling. It's about between 8, 8.30 in the morning. He starts yelling for help. All right. At this point, it's sad. He starts yelling, screaming for help. And this goes on for quite a while. So throughout the night, nothing. Starts yelling, screaming about eight o'clock. His uh, waiting on the nurse. Should somebody have called an ambulance? You damn right they should. Okay, but they did because they was listening to the nurse. So about ten thirty, somebody decides to show up to work. That's the nurse. 10.30 in the morning. So between 8 o'clock and the time that she decides to wake up or go to work, you have inmates listening to him, screaming for help. you got the cook listening to him, screaming for help. you got the jailer sitting there listening to him, screaming for help. And nobody calls a freaking ambulance for this kid. 10.30, she rolls around. She finally shows up at work with a cup and a, never mind. So, she don't go straight to him. It's all on video. She don't go straight to him. So, he's in there yelling. So, the jailer and the nurse finally go over to, to H1, to the door. Open up the door and that's where that famous belittling happens. Don't check on him, just belittles him. Just sad. Starts uh, threatening to put him on the D ring. If you don't know what a D ring is, it's a, it's a round thing in the hole that if it's not for punishment, it's for violent people, okay? Uh, if, if you've got somebody that's, that's beating on somebody that, that's totally out of control, you put them on a D ring. It's a, it's a deal in the floor, you handcuff them, they're on the floor, they can't move, all right? She's threatening to put him on this damn deer. Sorry my French, but I get worked up every time I think about this. So at 10.30 when she slams that door, you don't hear nothing from him. You know why you don't hear nothing from him? Because he's afraid he's gonna get deringed on that floor. Nobody's checking on him. So about 1, 1.30, whatever time the ambulance is finally called, the jailer goes down there to check on him, 
and says, uh, hey, you need to get up. The nurse wants to look at you because the jailers wanted to put him back in the pod. Mr. Ellis ain't responding. So he goes and gets the nurse, and she waddles down there and, and finally tries to do some vitals on him. Can't find none. Finds him in respiratory distress. Calls an ambulance. Ambulance comes, gets him. Take him out to the Sally Port to transport him. They start doing CPR in there, in, in the deal. And it was long enough to where a deputy started helping him. Deputy's doing what he can to help this guy. Well, in the meantime, watching the video, does the nurse go out to find out if anything's going on with this gentleman? Oh, hell no, All right? She starts talking about possible suicide, All right? And then she's got to leave because she's got to see her go pick up her grandkids while this guy's dying in an ambulance in South. So that's the timeline of Mr. Ellis. He wasn't screaming for help for days. He was screaming for help for about six hours. About one minute too long. Okay? Um, that happened, Mr. Ellis passed away on October 15th, 2015. As soon as Derek Derwin saw or was told that there was a death in that jail, he pulled the DVRs for the cameras. Mr. Derwin started watching video, but there was no audio. Those cameras had audio, but that system, they couldn't figure out the audio all the time. So there was no audio. So he's watching to make sure they did their 15 minute checks. That's what he's watching. So he found that the more he played it, it started recording over itself. So he stopped because he got a preservation letter from a lawyer and he put it in evidence. That was on 10 22 of 2017. Nobody knew there was audio. Nobody. So that sat in evidence until. July of 2017, and Mr. Smolin's law firm files a tort claim in June of 2017. So in July of 2017, the county's attorneys come and get the DVR. So you're looking at almost two full years since he passed away until the lawsuit and all that. Nobody knew there was audio. Well, in November of 2017, our law firm writes a letter to the sheriff at the time just about the case, no mention of audio. So there's no audio in November of 2017. So that's two years, one month. In December of 2017 is when the audio is found. December of 2017, the county's law firm found it, found the audio. At that time, they hand it over to Smola, and that's when really, <coughs> starts going downhill for the county. So you had two full years of nobody knowing that audio was on that camera. Two full years. Well, one of the questions is, well, why can't somebody get charged for this? Okay? Believe me, I want somebody to get charged for this. All right? As soon as this trial was over, me and Doug Hewitt sat down and started looking at statutes. We found second degree manslaughter. And I was wanting second degree manslaughter on a nurse. We couldn't do it because the statute of limitations at the time is three years. Okay? So the last time anybody could get charged, the last day anybody could get charged for Mr. Ellis's death second-degree manslaughter was October 22nd, 2018. Okay? So from the time the audio was found until October 22nd, 
October 22nd of 2018, the FBI was called. All right? It was turned over to the FBI for civil rights violations. Okay? People can get criminally charged for civil rights violations with the FBI. Why it didn't happen, I don't know. That's not on me. That's not on this VA. Okay? A lot of people say, well, why didn't the last district attorney not file charges against the nurse because he gave it to the FBI. Everybody up here that's in law enforcement understands how the government works, but when you hand it to the FBI and you only have like five months until you can charge them, statute of limitations wore out. So nobody can be charged right now for that. It's done. It's over. Nobody's going to get charged for it. Nobody, okay, Everybody's saying, well, even after the death, you still kept them on. Yeah. Nobody knew there was audio until when? December of 2017. The nurse quit June of 2017. All the jailers left in 2016 that was involved in this. So nobody was even still employed at the Ottawa County Sheriff's Office when the audio was found. I keep getting questions, well, you still got people working there. That was part of the Ellis deal. There's nobody working at the Ottawa County Sheriff's Office right now that was part of that lawsuit. Nobody. There was one jailer that worked that midnight shift as a deputy now with the Ottawa County Sheriff's Office. But he wasn't involved in the lawsuit, and he was administrative, administrative action was taken against him in 2015. That's the Ellis time frame. It's sad what happened. I'm telling you, if I had to sit there as a kid, or a, as a parent, listen to that about my kid, I'd go nuts. But that's the Ellis time frame. So he didn't sit there for days screaming for help. It was about six hours worth. You have one person responsible for that, and we can't charge him. So that's where the Ellis case is. Now, I want to also bring up a TikTok video, because I know it's going to get asked about a blonde lady that was arrested at a uh, marijuana grill last week, OK? This office had nothing to do with that marijuana grow arrest. Nothing whatsoever. We just house them. Okay? She's complaining that she gets to the county jail and she didn't get her two phone calls. That's absolutely correct. Because there were several people getting booked in at that time and she was put in the pod. Well, in the pod, you have 24-hour access to phones. All right? The jailer should have gave her a phone call. Didn't happen. But she didn't wait. 48 hours to get a phone call. I've got it on tape. She was on the phone making a phone call herself within 24 hours. Another thing that she's saying is that she didn't get to see a judge for 48 hours. That's a lie, folks. That's complete hogwash. She saw a judge the next day. You have 48 hours to do an arraignment. All right? She saw a judge within 24 The PCs weren't in. So she stayed in jail until the next arraignment date, which was Friday. And then she saw the judge again, and she got her bond set. Okay? I've already told you once, she didn't get a match, or shame on me. All right? But she didn't get her two phone calls. Shame on me. But she was able to make phone calls. She's got 24 hour access to phone calls in her pod, and she was able to see a judge within that time frame that she's supposed to be able to see a judge. So I want to clear that TikTok thing up. I'm so sick of social media. I work more working on social media than what I'm supposed to do for you all. And I'm sick of it. But that should clear up a lot of the Ellis questions, and that should clear up a lot of the blonde at the marijuana girl questions. Okay? I wasn't at the marijuana grow. I don't care about the marijuana grow. 
We busted two. I'm still trying to get land from the marijuana grow. Okay? I'm still trying to get trucks and stuff, all that from marijuana grows. I could care less. You people need to understand these marijuana grows, they may have the licenses, but it doesn't mean the license is legit, and it doesn't mean that they're not selling black market marijuana. It's happening every day. There you go. Thank you very much for that. Uh, <laughs> okay, now if we could please, uh, for those that have questions, uh, if you could just step up to the line in the podium here, we'll get your questions asked and we can get moving on. Thank you. Yeah, just press that and please address who you want the question answered by or the whole panel.
They go in and out during the night. You know, sometimes I think, well, maybe two o'clock would be a nice time to watch them. So I get up and they go in and out, in and out, in and out. And the smell permeates my walk. You know, so when I call and I say, gee, you know, there's a bunch of, bunch of people living down on this house. You know, I think there really something needs to be done. I make that call expecting some kind of resolution on that call. And I'm concerned because I'm not getting that. It's a fact. Now, my other thing is the destruction of these homes. Had that mentioned earlier, okay? How would one give the list of the destruction locations and the date? Now, I asked a couple of questions from someone, I'm not going to name their name, and I wanted to know what the crew number was for the city that does the destruction. They said there was three members on the destruction crew. Well, I can understand why you don't get a house tore down for three years. And oh, by the way, the first, the, the last, address that I gave you, it burnt down three years ago. And I've caught it several times. And that's where a guy got burned in there, up on there. My other thing is, what would a concerned Miami resident have to do to get men back on the ballot, ballot to change it from a misdemeanor back to a felony? How would one do that? Okay, now that's a couple of questions there. But petition, I'm sure there's citizens here that's concerned when would like that meth back as a felony, not a misdemeanor. That's why your city court's so busy. Now, I don't mean to be condescending by no means. I am concerned about my welfare, my welfare since the bars, people. I can't come through the bar so they just break out my windows. That's a major concern for me. I have an alarm system. I have a gun. I'm ex-Navy. I know how to use a weapon. And it wouldn't bother me to use it. So, having said all that, whoever has an answer to any of this, Start with the uh, drug and misdemeanor issue. Uh, I agree with you. But that is a state law. It was voted in by the people of the state of Oklahoma in state question maybe in 2017. Mm -hmm. That is a statute. There are several, I was in the legislature at the time that that was done. And by the way, I spoke in every group that I could telling everybody, this proposed state question is a horrible piece of legislation and you're gonna regret it. I already do. Well, I do too. Um, there was a, a uh, group of us from both sides of the aisle that went to the leadership and said, you know, we've got to fix some of these problems from state question 780. And they said, leadership said, no, we're not gonna thwart the will of the people. What they often said is, if the people voted it in, only the people can change it. That's a bold-faced lie. The legislature could change it if they had the gumption and the intestinal fortitude to do their jobs properly. But the leadership will not let it happen. We went to them and said, at least, you know, right now, I could take 25 pounds of marijuana into Miami Public Schools. You know what I'm committing? A misdemeanor. A misdemeanor, right. We went to them and said, at least let us reinstate the drug-free school laws. Nope. We're not going to let you do it. It doesn't take the voters to do anything if the legislature would do their job and fix these poor, poor pieces of legislation that the voters voted in. They did it with marijuana. 
the marijuana law was, was even, in many ways, it was even worse than uh, 780 was. Uh, but they, they didn't care about it. They didn't do anything to fix it until the other states started complaining because 98%, that's the estimate from OBNDD, 98% of the marijuana grown in Oklahoma was illegally leaving Oklahoma and being sold in other states. It wasn't until other states other states started complaining that the legislature decided to do anything to fix the problems by the by the 788, the marijuana bill. The legislature can fix it. It doesn't take a vote of the people. They just don't have the leadership to do it. So, but we in, in Miami, Oklahoma can't do anything. It's the state law. We're bound by the state law. Okay, I get that. I understand that. I understand that completely. But my thing is, do we contact the legislators? How would the normal, everyday, hard-working American get in touch with somebody other than leaving a message on their phone at their office? What, how, would you, how would you suggest that someone address that issue? I have a talk with this young lady right in front here. She does a grad job. A grand job of getting legislators to listen. Okay, well let's do that. All right. Now my other thing was uh, the house, the abandoned houses, which you didn't think was such an issue. I can assure you they are. Now, how again? How would I get a list of the homes that are on that destruction list and an estimated time that they're going to? Destroyed. Because I know if those houses were not standing in my neighborhood, those meth heads would have nowhere to sleep. <laughs> okay. All right. We have a city department that deals strictly with that code compliance. Mm -hmm. If you would give me your information, I will forward that and we'll make sure that we're, I get you in touch with code compliance. Okay. And uh, they can explain how they demo houses, what they demo. I know the city spends tens of thousands of dollars a year demoing houses. Mm -hmm. We can only do so many a year. And there's a long list. But they would be more than happy to reach out to you. That is a co compliance issue that they'll explain their process. Uh, this is a law enforcement panel, but I will be more than happy to get you in touch with them okay. so they can explain that and, and maybe do a better job of articulating than I can of uh, what that procedure is. Okay, I will, I will get with you and get okay. that information Absolutely. from you. And, and the other thing is, those three houses that I gave you addresses for, they're still in and out. So if you just want to drive by, check on the house, you know, in a, in a late hour. And I got 514 1st, 2nd, and G, and I, I missed the third, what was it? Okay, 514 1st, Southwest. Right. It's at the corner of 1st and 2nd, right. Southwest. The other one is 30G, Southwest. And the other, the other one is 2G, Southwest. Right, I got those two, I'll get the other ones. Okay. And, and the, uh, the one, the 30G Southwest, that's the, the big two-story red brick house. Mm -hmm. They're in there all the time. They board up the windows, they just take the windows out. It's a board. They just knock them out, go in there. They're living there. Okay? So, uh, <coughs> yes, that was Dr. Gray's house. Yeah. Yeah, they're in there all the time. And they're, and they're cooking, you know? And I'm not talking french fries. <laughs> You're well aware of it here. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate your question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, who's next, please? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. about the house, 
I live near Washington School right now, and I've lived in the same house for 36 years. And I had a house located at 1847 B Northeast. That took me 13 years to get it tore down. And the reason they said it took so long was because it fell through the cracks. It wasn't that I didn't call, I called, believe me. But they said it fell through the cracks and the city only allocates $50,000 a year is what I was told, Ben shaking his head yes in agreement. $50,000 a year is all that's allocated to tear down these abandoned buildings. We've got a real problem right now with the one on Steve Owens Boulevard. You know where I'm talking about. The poor man dog well, There's nothing wrong I'm here, with I'm that. I'm the owner right here, so I'll talk to you about that. Wasn't there a shooting there? No, there was a gun put to my head and the cops released the guy without putting any charges on him either. Okay, let's keep in the order, please. Appreciate but, it. But, but uh, you know, there's people staying in there and I believe there's people staying under the Tar Creek Bridge and they're living under there. I've been by there in the wintertime on my way to work and seen smoke coming from under that bridge where they're starting a fire to warm themselves. I don't blame them. And I, I will say on the jail subject, I was invited to tour the jail, and I did. And it was everything that David says and more. Uh, I believe everything he said tonight about the jail. It, it's not even a polished term. <laughs> it, it, ain't, it ain't halfway there. But, but you know, uh, I thought tonight we were looking for solutions. And I haven't heard any solutions. And, and this lady had a good thought about the recalling that and, and being partially answered that. But if the legislature won't repeal that law, then we need to do something. We, I asked Doug the other day, I see Doug out sometimes. And I asked Doug the other day, who would we get to write a petition? And we could start it from here, it's gotta start somewhere. And because of our geographical location in my Oklahoma, we're so close to Missouri and Kansas and Arkansas. When we pass that law, decriminalizing meth, we invited the meth users from those neighboring states to come here and make their home because now they won't get in trouble. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Yeah. But, uh, we gotta do something. We gotta get this changed, and we gotta we gotta go back to making a felony not a thousand dollars worth of property. It, it's got to be less than that because you know someone can break in your home and steal almost anything in your home. It's not worth a thousand dollars. I mean, a used couch, a used TV, none of that stuff's worth a thousand dollars. So so they're not gonna get a felony for breaking in your house. I mean, unless somebody's there, probably. But, you know, we gotta do something. We gotta get started. Even if we're not right, we gotta do something. We gotta make a move. And hopefully, you know, I agree with this lady. Let's get a petition started. I asked Doug the other day, who do we get to write this petition? I'm not a lawyer, and I'm sure it has to be worded right. So we need to, we need to get started and do something, even if, even if we're not doing the right thing. I'd call your state rep. That, that's the first thing I would agree. Contact that state representative first. Well, he's not going to write it. But, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying he can write it. I know one of them can. No, but I mean, and Ben's already said they're, they're not going to change things. So, I mean, we've got to approach it from a different angle, man. So, Daryl, if I could address some of that. If you want to go the petition route, the voters always have that, that option. Uh, the number of signatures you, you need is based on the last gubernatorial uh, number of people that voted the last time. Somebody needs to fix these microphones. Uh, so it would take probably about 280,000 signatures. <laughs> Done. You're not going to get 280,000 signatures. No, no, no. 
But you're, you're also right that when we passed 780, we invited all the donors from our neighboring states to come here. We've also invited all the thieves, the professional thieves, to come here because if they get caught back home, it's a felony. They get caught here, it's a misdemeanor. And there's really no consequences. And, and in fact, and it's worse now with legislation that all are. that, the thieves and the dopers, if you're going to use that term, are the same people. A lot of them, yeah. You know, they're using the, the profits from the uh, stealing to finance their habits, you know. So. Well, just wait. Because uh, the legislature passed a bill this year that come November 1st, there is nothing that's going to be able to do, be done, at least at the misdemeanor level, against a thief or a donor. Well, nothing. Another thing on these uh, abandoned buildings and houses, I, I've suggested several times, Wapaw Tribe has their own uh, demolition crew, more or less, with, with the uh, EPA stuff that they do. They have backhoes, they have dump trucks, uh, you know, in their possession. I've suggested several times, too, that we at least talk to them <coughs> And, and see if we can't work something out where they can come in here and get rid of some of these old buildings and rid our town of some of this problem. Maybe they will, maybe they won't, but it doesn't hurt to ask. All they can do is say no. And, and uh, you know, since they have the manpower and the equipment already in place, maybe they might do two or three a year as a favor to us. I don't know. But we need to get on that and, you know, try to ask them. Okay. We, we need to address the real problem, the homelessness and the lack of facilities to take care of those people, the lack of assistance. We have no facilities <coughs> anywhere in Miami that help or house homeless people. You're correct. And, and yeah. the reason we don't is because there's so much liability involved. You know, everybody has what I like to call a bleeding heart. I'm going to volunteer. I'm going to volunteer to come help you at that homeless shelter. Well, once they figure out that you, you just sit your wife or whoever up there and they're spend, spending the night with a bunch of uh, drug heads or criminals or, not everybody that's homeless is in that right. same boat. But a lot of the problem we have here in Miami, Oklahoma, the homeless and the drug people go hand in hand. But not everybody. That's a lack of infrastructure, a lack of uh, but no with, health and, and so Yeah, but with the liabilities involved, nobody wants to open a homeless shelter. Because the insurance alone, I mean, imagine if someone were to get raped or murdered in, a, in your facility, if you had the facility. It, it's just, it's just going to be terrible. I mean, and this judgment we just got against the county, I mean, the same thing could happen to a homeless shelter. And I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm right, but we need to do something. We need to move forward and get past this. And, you know, I understand the position that you guys are in, but, you know, from a citizen's standpoint, we need to do something. It's not going to get any better if we don't try something. Even if it's not right, we got to try something. I agree, Darrell. Thank you very much for the comments. Uh, anybody else? Okay. Yeah. So, I'm, I'm with and the reason why I'm Can you stand up? And I'm going to address this real quick. And, uh, the there were people in there is because when my dad died and I got it, I wanted to open a business there and the city wouldn't let me. But I had all my things. Okay, now do you have a question that you want to? I was going to answer his question real quick. Because I need to be taking the whole town talking about my car lot. And I know they are. That's why I'm here. We can't see them. So I need to be addressed because I had a ton of people there. And they wouldn't let me have business. Everybody was robbing it. I couldn't stay up there. They're telling me to leave. But I said, you know what? Forget it. You want me to help me? And they wouldn't even keep me the microphone. So I let people go in there and watch it for me. And I did until Boy, that guy ends up with a gun, and I looked at a gun in my head, and I realized that they had had drugs in there, and I told them no drugs were in my building, and all of them are gone, and they'll be the only way to go there now is if they're my sister robbing it, 
several times, I yeah, believe. If you, if you Hold on. But to use that building now, it's, it's I believe it's condemned. How can a brick building be condemned? Because it's been flooded, ma'am. So the other one right there. My, my advice would be to tear it down. Well, I'm not just doing anything, right? I'm still but I'm just saying, you want to you want to fix the problem, well, fix there's a solution, it. is to tear it down. There's nothing will be allowed back in there again. They're next door, and they're flooded too. They're active right now. The city's picking who's choosing. Uh, okay, thank you. I appreciate your time. Uh, who's next? We're not tearing the building down. My name is Kay Russell. I live at 117 North Pines Commerce, Oklahoma. Can't hear. Can you hear me now? I think so. No. Is it all well? Um, again, my name is Kay Russell. I live at 117 North Pines Commerce, Oklahoma. You might. And. February the 14th of this year, I was involved in a house fire. And we were in bed asleep. Everybody else was out on the block. Um, and praise the Lord for the Quapaw Fire Department. Because they were the first ones to show up. Then the Miami Fire Department. And then the Commerce Fire Department. And also, I have made many complaints on this resident next door to me that burnt to the ground. And I have made numerous reports on this house next door. And I go up and I ask for my report, because I'd like a copy of it. Oh, we don't have it anymore. Well, why not? Well, we just don't. Then, at one time, I made a seven-page report that I was totally dishonored, disgraced by a city employee, and the chief was sent right there, not this one, the former one, sent right there and listened to the whole thing. Never said a word. So I said, okay, I'm gonna make this report word for word, which I did. Then I took it back in the next day for him to sign, and he refused to sign it. Ernie had to sign it. I said, Ernie, this. You did. Then he pulls out his next door, pulls out his sheet of paper and says, hey, I made my own report. Then, and I basically said, okay, in other words, you're telling me my report means nothing. Pretty much. And then with this house bar, any kind of domestic problems or anything else, we have to call the Miami PD to even get a commerce police officer to read, you know, come out and investigate anything. So I want to praise the Lord for the Guapo Marshal Department because every time I get a call, I call Miami, they ask me if I'm a tribal member, and I say, yes, I am. I want a marshal, Guapo Marshal. And they come right out and they take care of business. Isaac North is a wonderful individual. He's helped me out twice. And this house next door to us, my husband and I, has been condemned. But there for a while, these people were allowed to go back in there and get whatever they wanted. But there's this condemned sign on there. And I told the city manager and the code enforcer, if you're not going to enforce your own city ordinances, take those things down. Now, I, like I said, I'm really curious because this fire cost me 
$15,000 with my insurance out of my own pocket. This individual had no insurance. They're not doing anything with her. So I just want to tell you I admire the Papa Marshalls for coming out and, and the fire department. Like I said, they were the first ones there. In fact, they're the ones that told us to get out of our house. The people next door, there was eight of them in there and not one of them came over and knocked on my door to tell me their house was on fire. And I, I get really upset about this because it, you know, we could have lost our lives in this, but nothing is being done. And, and I've been told, oh, it could take up to three years for that house to be torn down. And I'm thinking, why? Again, it's this thing, no money. Then I found out that the code enforcement's under the police department, which that means no money for them because it all goes to the police department. Uh, now, actually, that that's right? not true. He is under my department, but his money and my money is completely separate. I don't have anything at all to do with his money. He's only allowed about 3,000 a year to tear down houses. And we've got numerous in the town that are to be torn down, but understand this, I have absolutely nothing to do with his money. That's between him and Michael Hart and not me. Well, I was informed today. You were informed wrong. So then I'll address that with that individual. I have absolutely nothing to do with his money. Well, you know, it's kind of like I talked to Michael about that, too, you know, and, and it's so nonchalantly, you know, right now I'm getting cockroaches, I'm getting mice, and I've never had that problem. And, oh, the grass in the backyard is taller than I am. The side on the south is up past my waist, and yet I was told there would be nothing done to clean anything up until September. But yet I've got to deal with all of this, and I can call me because it's right across the street from a head start. You know, it's a, it's a hazard, health hazard. And I've called my state representative. I've got no response there because it's kind of like a fell through the hole, the gray hole. But yet, I've got to deal with it. The whole neighborhood's got to deal with it because, like I said, head starts right across the street. I, I can understand, but you got to understand also, hey, you had five other houses before that one that burned down, we still have got to tear down. Your camera. Well, so you're on that list, yeah. oh, I know but it just takes time with it. very little funding. There's just not much we can do until we get money. I was able to get the county to tear a building down. The county is helping us some, so on some of them, but again, it's limited. You might have called that the county commissioner, right? Well, I have a question. Was there not a house on, or was it? It was I have no idea. I, I don't deal with the house here right now. Well, again, I'm addressing you, letting you know that as a tribal member, now I'm not a Quapa, I'm not a Maya Nation, but I just wanted you to know that I appreciate you for being there for that, that night. It was a horrible night for me because I was standing there watching my house burn. And I just thank you. I want to thank you for those compliments, and I will let the staff know. And just so everybody knows, the Quapaw Nation, uh, since I've been there, you know, you've seen what, all the things that the tribe does for the community. Just so it, folks know uh, the millions of dollars that they're putting into public safety, the tribe is doing that out of the tribe's general funds. It's not, I get very little money from the federal government for law enforcement. We don't get any federal money for our our department or anything else. So I had to give some uh, kudos to the tribe for all the money that they put in because it doesn't only just affect the Quapaw Nation and the, the folks within the boundaries. We, we do fire services, EMS services, and actually the, the marshals help outside of the, the Quapaw Nation Reservation. So thank you for those comments and, and that's what we're here for. We love all of, of our citizens and uh, commerce, Quapaw, all in the reservation in Ottawa County and, and the tribe is here to help in those areas. So if there is things that you folks, uh, just kind of like what we talked about with the city of Miami, 
if there's something that fits, you know, that you want to address with the tribe, I would definitely ask because if there is resources for them to be able to do something to help in those areas. Uh, we've got a very good business committee uh, that's very proactive, so absolutely ask those questions. I have met some of your members on your business committee, and they are wonderful people. Thank you, Ms. Kay. Okay, anybody else? Yes, sir. Yes, thank you, sir. Are there any plans of bringing, uh, getting the Citizens Academy going again? Uh, yes, we do have, uh, have talked about it. We ran Citizens Academy for several years. Uh, through the COVID years, we gave it up. We, in the last couple of years, we had lower participation. We have had several inquiries, uh, people asking about it. So it is something we want to do again. It's a great uh, way for citizens to get involved in PD and this experience. We ran it, uh, it was about 10 weeks prior and once a week citizens came out, got to do ride alongs, learn different parts of what we do. And that was something we want to continue. We just haven't uh, got that started yet. Any uh, follow-up questions? Do you have a time frame in mind? I hope to uh, probably next year start with. Okay. And uh, since since it was brought up, uh, the Ellis case, what was the timeline at which the uh, blanket was wrapped around his neck? Hey, I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. I do I forgot something. Did I bring up uh, when Avery, he was getting CPR in the ambulance that the nurse was in there talking about that? Okay. Because it was mentioned that there was a, not a blanket, it was a towel. And uh, it was mentioned, hey, was that towel wrapped around his neck? And the judge said, hell no, it was laying on his uh, chest. So there was some discussion there from someone talking about a possible suicide. I hope that answered your question. I know you got that. Yeah. Back to the Kellis deal. Hold your camera before you break it, okay? I've got another one that I don't know about. Well, I've been in the next to the tracks. My entire city's been back and 